So everybody, welcome to the University of Michigan Biological Station Seminar Series. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Amy Claston, and I'm the director of UMBS. Tonight, I get the absolute pleasure to introduce our Pat McGill lecturer. But before I do that, I'd like to acknowledge that the University of Michigan Biological Station exists on lands once occupied by the Burt Lake Band of the Ottawa and Chippewa people. In coming together this evening, we respectfully acknowledge the original inhabitants and descendants of the land that we now manage for purposes of preservation, research, and education. We ask our community and visitors to respect the integrity of the land that was home to indigenous people before our state and our university were established by acknowledging their gifts to us. This requires that our programs of research, education, and outreach focus on the connections of all people to other living things and our land, water, and air. So tonight we have Dr. Jessica Hellman joining us as our endowed Pat McGill lecturer. Dr. Hellman is a professor at the University of Minnesota, where she's the director of the Institute on the Environment and a faculty in ecology and evolutionary biology department. Prior to Minnesota, Dr. Hellman was a professor at Notre Dame University, a postdoc at the University of British Columbia, a PhD student at Stanford University, and an undergraduate at the University of Michigan. Um, and one of the reasons I've invited Jessica here tonight is that she's also an alumni of Bug Camp. So I know we have a lot of students in the audience tonight, and I thought they would find Jessica's work as inspiring as I do, which is one of the reasons that I've um, invited her here. Um, she is clearly leading the, nation, the, <laughs> the national and international conversation on adaptation to climate change. For example, she's been a leader in discussing assisted migration as climate change adaptation strategies. In addition to being a leading ecologist and conservation biologist, she sits on numerous boards, writes a ton of popular articles, works with state and national governments on natural resource management, and is a teacher and mentor. I could spend many, many hours this evening not letting Jessica talk, just discussing all the cool things that she's done in the fields of conservation, climate change, and ecology, and how her work at Minnesota and other institutions is changing the national and international decisions on climate action. But that's not what I really wanna introduce with Jessica tonight. I wanted to be a little bit more personal and highlight why she, in my opinion, was the perfect pick for the Pat and Gail lecture at UMBS this evening. So Dr. Hellman and Dr. Pet and Gill share many characteristics. Um, they are both top-notch natural historians and are known for their efforts to educate the general public about the importance of natural systems. They're both pioneers in the classroom where Pat and Gill changed how we taught ornithology and Dr. Hellman has built programs focused on sustainability. Over the course of his career, Pat and Gill trained over 800 students at the University of Michigan Bio Biological Station who went on to shape the field of ornithology. Dr. Hellman is also having a huge imprint on the numbers of people pursuing research on climate change and climate adaptation. In fact, I have worked with Jessica Hellman <laughs> when she was a PhD student at Stanford. So way back in the day, I was teaching middle school and I spent my weekends volunteering in Jessica's research program, counting endangered checker spot butterflies across serpentine grasslands in California. She very, very patiently taught me what these little caterpillars look like, how to cant them, and in the process of teaching me lots of things about caterpillars and conservation, she also taught me about experimental design, having important controls to your studies, dealing with lots and lots of field data, and how to think through complicated ecological problems and questions. She also showed me how to manage a very large field crew throughout her entire career. Jessica was absolutely inspiring as a scientist and she still is today. In fact, there's absolutely no question that I would have become an ecologist if I had not been able to bump into Jessica and have her sort of kickstart my career um, early on. Her passion for the environment, her ability to communicate clearly about important environmental issues and her ability to inspire many, many, many people like myself to pursue work in the environment continues to be just incredible even today. So I hope that we can get her back to UMBS for a visit next summer so that many of you will be able to discuss your science and talk about your career trajectories with Jessica. She is truly an inspiration. So tonight, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce former bug camper, Jessica Hellman, and her talk on population biology in study, in practice, and in the human imagination. So welcome, Jessica. Thanks for oh joining us. Oh my gosh, <laughs> Amy, that was so, I'm teary-eyed. That's extraordinary. Thank you so much for that uh, amazing introduction. It's also really wonderful to hear about uh, Dr. Pettengill and what an honor it is to carry his legacy forward and to be able to be with all of you uh, tonight to talk about 
some ideas that we think are important and that I want to try to inspire you to consider and carry forward in your own work. So I want to thank everyone for signing on tonight. And of course, I want to thank Amy for the invitation to be here. Uh, and I need to share my screen. Okay, let's see if that works. Aim, if you're still there, can you unmute and tell me if you can see that slide? I can see your slide. Perfect, thank you very much. And I have my chat window here because I'm gonna invite us to use the chat window in a moment. Okay, before I get started, I have a very, very important news announcement. Today is Amy Klassen, director of the University of Michigan Biological Station's birthday. Uh, and so when we were talking about when I might come and do this lecture and Jenny and I were talking about what day would be good, I said, oh my, we have to do it on Amy's birthday. So happy birthday, Amy. I wish I was there to eat a birthday cupcake with you, my friend. Uh, and I wanna make sure that everyone across camp knows that it's your birthday if they didn't already and be sure everyone to wish her a terrific um, day. Okay, Thanks, Jessica. Jessica. <laughs> With that important announcement aside, we should turn back to the task at hand. So as a bit of introduction, I wanna tell you where I'm signing in from. And so firstly, I come to you from the Institute on the Environment at the University of Minnesota. This is an interdisciplinary university-wide think tank. Um, we pursue research, we do what we call leadership development and public communications. And together with the Department of Ecology, Evolution and Behavior, the Institute on the Environment and the University of Minnesota are great places for graduate and postdoctoral study and for collaboration on natural resource issues and solutions. So I hope all of you will check out the Institute on the Environment and EEB um, at the University of Minnesota. But physically, I'm joining you actually from the Arrowhead region of Minnesota, which is, I'm actually immediately adjacent to the Boundary Waters. Um, this is a canoe wilderness area. This is a really important conservation and recreation area. But as Aimee referenced, this region is also a place where uh, Ojibwe, indigenous Ojibwe people, today exercise their 1854 treaty rights, including the cultivation of rice, moose hunting, and walleye fishing. So this place where I am is, remarkable, is a place of remarkable ecological and cultural significance. And for me, being an ecologist has always been about finding a sense of place because for me, it makes my science and my own thoughts about stewardship uh, possible. And speaking of place, another place that has been very important to me is Northern Michigan and the U of M Biostation. Amy mentioned I was a U of M undergrad. I spent the summer before my junior year at UMBS taking general ecology with Claudia Joles and mammalogy with Phil Myers. It was at UMBS where I learned for the first time what statistics was actually for. I had already taken statistics, but I was, remember still sitting in a computer lab thinking, oh, that's what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, it was also the first time I connected to a scholarly community, and I also uh, played a lot of volleyball, and I hope you guys are doing those things too. UMBS really helped to shape who I am today, and I'm still studying ecology and conservation and environmental science 25 years later. All right, with that sense of place in mind, where I am now, where you all are in our connection to one another, let's come back to what my presentation is gonna be about. My talk today is gonna to be a retrospective. And my broad goal is to share with you why population biology is so important. And I think still underappreciated in climate change science. I'm gonna to stitch together a bunch of my work and the work of some other people to tell a story about the future of biodiversity and how we might confront our stewardship responsibilities as the climate changes. In fact, some of this work I'm gonna share with you is pretty, pretty old, more, some of it more than a decade now. 
but I think the lessons are still important. And I think this research tells us important work that still remains to be done. So the next thing I want to do is introduce you to my muse. Butterflies are gonna have sat, they sit at the center of my journey to understand climate impacts and climate management. And you're gonna hear about several butterflies today. Why butterflies? Well, I have repeatedly turned to butterflies basically because we know a lot about their biology. We know their geographic distribution. In many cases, we know what they eat. That's often because they're pretty. People have been watching them for some time. But they also live and die fairly quickly, making it possible to study population dynamics and their responses to changing conditions. And importantly, I think that butterflies can tell us a lot about a lot more than just butterflies or even insects for that matter. For me, they shine a light on important processes and they even raise questions about who we are as people. And I hope to show you what I mean by who we are as people. All right, climate change. I don't need to tell this audience that climate change is happening or give you statistics about it, but I do want to remind us how much biology cares about climate change. So global climate models predict that under a business as usual emission scenario, like shown in this slide, we should expect to see upwards to, of five to six degrees C warming over land by the end of this century. And the reason why I think it's important to think about that in terms of biology is because even to folks like myself who think about climate change on a regular basis, five or six degrees is a little tricky to wrap my head around. It doesn't make that much intuitive sense. But the last time the climate was six degrees C cooler, Death Valley, which is shown here on the left hand part of the slide, was a mesic forest like the picture on the right hand side of the slide. So think about that, a place now that is one of the hottest places on the earth, a desert ecosystem, was dominated by evergreen forest when the climate was on average six degrees cooler during the peak of the last ice age. That's a big difference biologically. The last time CO2 concentration was uh, what we see today, or when the climate was in equilibrium with that concentration, there were relatives of alligators living at the poles. Big biological difference. I also wanna take a moment to remind ourselves what we're seeking to conserve under climate change. Of course, we're concerned about human well-being and human systems, but when we look at ecological systems, we're often concerned with the preservation of biodiversity and the processes that are associated with biodiversity. Of course, we're concerned that entire species could be eliminated, eliminated from Earth with a warmer and more extreme climate, but we also care about the genetic diversity of species that could be reduced, the ecosystem functions, and services in particular locations may decline or be eliminated. And populations play a critical role in all of these biodiversity levels. So I wanna try a little bit of Zoom interactivity. Okay, so if we can open the chat window, I have the chat window myself. I have a question for you. I'd like, to, like you to type into the chat window your guess some of you might know, there is no official right answer to this question, but what do you think? If we were just, just focusing on whole species, that aspect of biodiversity, what percentage of species on earth do you think would be committed to extinction, which means they're on a path to extinction within the next hundred years, principally due to climate change? If you could type your answer into the chat window, I'd really like to see what people have to say. So I'll give you a second to do that. No right or wrong answers. I love question marks. And give us a couple more here. Forty to seventy, that's a range. Forty, twenty-five. So fifty, these are all these are all pretty high, aren't they? Okay. So here's what other scientists think about that question. 
Brian's actually closer to what we found when we asked published researchers. Several years ago, we surveyed thousands of published biologists, and we found that the more that people knew about climate change, the more worried they were about it. And they predicted more extinction with higher levels of self-reported knowledge. So the percentage of species that they think will go extinct and what they report as their uh, understanding of either climate change itself or of ecological responses to climate change. The most knowledgeable scientists predicted that about 10% or a little bit more than 10% of non-microbial species will go extinct solely because of climate change. This is the question. Other estimates using other methods than expert judgment suggest that uh, extinction rates be, could be between nine and 50%, a huge range. But let's run with this kind of conservative number. Where's my, let's see here. Yeah, let's run with this kind of conservative number of 10%. If we follow this, if we assume an estimate of 9 million eukaryotic species globally, 10% is 900,000 species. 900,000 species could go extinct from climate change within the next few decades. That is a reasonable, relatively conservative estimate of those that are out there. Recently, IPBES, the Global Biodiversity Assessment, suggested that a million species are threatened from extinction, from climate change, and from other stressors. So I would really like to know, I would really like to know who are those 900,000 species? What are the processes that put them at risk? What can we do to stop their extinction or the risk of their extinction? And I wanted the same thing for the loss of genetic diversity and ecosystem services. And wondering these things has occupied my whole career as an ecologist, as an institute leader, and even recently as a business owner. I want to understand, and then I want to do productive things to address climate change using that understanding. All right, to think about population biology and climate change, it's helpful to toss a word out, a word that you all know, adaptation. For biologists, what is adaptation? It means evolution, a process of change by which an organism or species becomes better suited to its environment. But for the rest of the climate change community, Adaptation refers to human interventions that reduce the harms caused by climate change. A change or adjustment to improve something, to make it more suitable to a different situation, in this case, to a altered climate. Shorthand, we can think of these two ideas of adaptation as evolution and management. And of course, the two concepts can also interact. So digging into this first concept of adaptation, the first idea of adaptation a bit deeper, I think we should be particularly interested in local adaptation. So what is local adaptation? It's something that leads to functional genetic variation across the species range. And that functional genetic variation can relate to or include climatic performance. So this is a variety of populations within a species range that vary in their climatic tolerances and preferences because of evolutionary processes. Local adaptation or this kind of functional divergence among populations is important because it influences species responses to climate change. Functional genetic differences among populations can be helpful by providing a basis for de novo adaptive evolution and by supplying ecotypes to sort into new climatic niches. But it also could be harmful, this functional genetic differences among populations within a species, because the more populations are locally adapted, the more they will uniformly decline from climate change. And if populations at the leading edge of a range decline, that could undermine the potential for poleward range expansion. In my opinion, then, we should be looking for and trying to understand local adaptation with respect to climate and climate change. 
And I'd like to give you an example of what I mean. So almost two decades ago, after I finished grad school and AMA and I were running around chasing caterpillars in the serpentine grassland, I went looking for a, a study system where we could look at multiple species at the same time that have a similar geography and a similar geographic range boundary. And I found that in the oak savannas of Western North America and in the butterfly and plant species that live there. So students and I built a bunch of studies that focus on populations at the leading edge of this ecosystem and compared those to populations near the range center. And we expected that in the absence of local adaptation, leading edge populations should increase under warming. But if they're locally adapted, they might decrease or they might not increase. And those decreases could constrain a species northward migration. So one study we did involved common garden and translocation experiments. And we did this with two contrasting species of butterfly. One species is a small specialist, this little brown one over here on the right. It's called the Properteus dusky wing. And the other species is a larger, stronger flying generalist, the Anna swallowtail. So first we conducted the experiment and measured a suite of physiological parameters such as size and survivorship and metabolism. And then we repeated the experiment and looked at genes that individuals expressed. And today there are way more powerful tools for gene expression than we were using at this time. And I wanna point out that this design has two experimental factors. It has source region, a peripheral source and a central source and it has two temperature treatments, being exposed to peripheral conditions and exposed to central conditions. And then you also can have the interaction between source region and temperature treatment. So I wanna show you some interesting results first for the swallowtail, this generalist strong flyer. Physiologically and in gene expression, we found no evidence of population differences with respect to climate at the edge and the center of the species range. Interestingly, we also didn't find that individuals grow or survive better under warming at the range, the, under warming at all, including at the range edge. And we found that fitness varied with the host plant species individuals were eating, especially under different temperatures. And the last of these is shown in this figure. The y-axis is the biomass of pupae. This is a measure of fitness at the, actually the end of the growing season. And this is how they perform the pupal mass under central and peripheral rearing conditions. And the lines in this graph connect the performance of individuals feeding on the same host. And we tested three host plants. So you'll see that one host is the best in the center, but a different host is the best at the range edge. So for this species, we found no evidence of local adaptation. In fact, we found no evidence of sensitivity to warming, but we did find a plant-mediated response to warming. So what about the other creature? In the small, more specialized butterfly species, we found entirely different things. First, we found that summer warming was beneficial for populations at the edge of the species range in both body size and survivorship. And we found evidence for local adaptation in the winter. So this graph shows the metabolic rate of caterpillars growing or um, they overwinter as caterpillars. So this is their metabolic rate during the winter time as they are sitting waiting for the winter to pass. The black bar, and this is a fitness metric, the black bars are individuals from the, that are taken from the center, and the gray are individuals taken from the periphery. And on the y-axis, you'll see um, their overwintering metabolic rate, and on the x-axis are the central rearing conditions and the peripheral rearing conditions. And you'll see that the size of the gray and black bars flip under central and peripheral conditions, and that suggests a localized response. But in particular, we saw a 43% increase in the metabolic rate, which is a fitness cost, in peripheral populations when you warm them up. So if you raise them under a warmer conditions. 
when we hybridize the mRNA of these animals that had been exposed to these temperature treatments, and we, custom, we hybridized that to a custom microarray to look at gene expression, we found more, in this particular butterfly species, the dusky wing, we found more than 300 genes that showed a genetic signal of local adaptation. And we could guess the function of 55 of them by homology to known genomes. So the four example genes on the top of the slide have higher expression in peripheral populations than in central ones. And the four example genes at the bottom are the opposite. But the pattern of differential expression was really quite consistent. And it's shown for all of the genes, example genes on this slide. And that pattern suggests that populations respond to the central conditions similarly, but they respond to peripheral conditions differently. So all of what I have just shared with you is one example of how to go looking for local adaptation. And the fact that you might find it in some cases and might not find it in other cases. We did not find a lot of evidence for warming being a good thing for peripheral populations actually in either species. But we did find that host plants mediated the warming response in one species, the bigger generalist. And we found some evidence for local adaptation or local tuning in the other more specialist species. So now I wanna show you another example of how population differences in climatic tolerance can be important in responses to climate change. And for this, I want to introduce you to another butterfly. This is the Carner blue butterfly. It's an endangered species that lives in the Midwest and Atlantic regions, though in fewer places nowadays. These black dots on this slide show where the Carner blue lives or where it did live in the recent past. And using a statistical niche model that maps these occupancy points to climate conditions, so it associates where the species lives with the climate, with climate characteristics, we can use that statistical association to predict the future occupancy of the Carner Blue when the climate changes. And so that the green shading in this slide shows the predicted occupancy by 2030 for this creature. And you'll see the conditions suitable for the Carner Blue begin to move northward. A few decades later, the conditions are moving even further northward. And by the end of the century, the green areas and the black dots are 500 kilometers apart. And that is a very, very long way for a small, fairly sedentary butter to fly to fly. But that is not the full story. From experience with the species, we knew that different portions of the Carner Blue's range actually have quite different climates. And you can see this difference in a principal components analysis. This analysis separates the Western and Eastern populations of the Carner Blue by a component of temperature and precipitation. So we went back to our model and treated these two climatic regions separately and built some new niche models and new future range projections. And we found that this made a difference in where we would predict the Carner Blue would live in the future. So in this figure on the left-hand side with the green blobs are, are, is the model for the species as a whole. I already showed you that result. But compare that to the right-hand side, which are the results of modeling the Eastern and Western populations separately. The orange are model predictions for the climate niche of the Western populations, and the blue are the predictions for the Eastern populations. So by the middle of the century, the whole species model on the left predicts habitat available in Ontario and Quebec, but the model on the right with the Eastern and Western forms separate, it doesn't show that it could live there. And toward the end of the century, the eastern populations are predicted to persist in the Appalachian Mountains, but the whole species model doesn't pick that possibility up. So from this model comparison with the Carner Blue, I hope you can see that considering the possibility of local adaptation can be important in determining how a species will fare under climate change and where it might be able to live under future conditions. 
And you would not get this result by considering the species as a whole. But we're not done with butterflies and local adaptation yet. Not quite yet. I'm going to give you one more scenario of population biology and climate change um, and biodiversity conservation or biodiversity processes to think about from a butterfly. So in this next study, we were interested in not just the movement of whole species across the landscape, like the capacity of northern populations to expand or the carner blue to move to those green, orange, and blue blobs. We are actually also interested in the possibility that genes could move across the landscape in response to climate change and whether or not genes could be locally adapted. So if you wanted to look at the geographic movement or possibility of movement of genes, you, a good place to go looking is a place where genes flow across species boundaries. So we studied population differentiation along a climatic gradient where two swallowtail species are known to hybridize. They hybridize actually um, not too far from where you all are as well. But we did our sampling in Wisconsin. We sampled thousands of individuals along this red line transect. We sampled them from down in the southern species, Papilio glaucus, across the hybrid zone and into the northern species, Papilio canadensis. So we sampled in Illinois and southern Wisconsin across the hybrid zone and into northern Wisconsin and Canada. So we then measured the whole genome composition of individuals along that transect using 214 RAD-seq loci. What the heck does that mean? RAD-seq is the technique that detects single nucleotide polymorphisms in small pieces of DNA by chopping up the genome and using a restriction enzyme. And if you have a reference genome, you can put those polymorphisms in different locations within the genome. So you can measure these little genetic differences across the entire genome. And this figure shows the amount of genetic differentiation among samples as measured by FST. So the little graphs show you the amount of genetic difference. Uh, across the whole genome. And the teeny tiny little red dots at the top, they show when those that FST is significantly different. So when the two species are different in that particular spot within the genome. And we've also marked with some colored bars, the known location of some morphological and chemical and other differences between the species and where they're known to occur. But what I want you to see is that divergence is spread across the entire genome lots of places in this genome where the two species are different. So I'll tell you the punchline about this hybrid zone. It's moving. And I'll show you how we make this interpretation. In this graph, I'd like you to first look at the blue lines. The blue lines represent samples that we collected along the transect in the 1980s. Actually, I didn't. Mark Scriber collected in the 1980s. Each one of these lines uh, shows the transition for a specific RADSEQ lo loci or locus from the glaucus formed over here in the south. These are fixed for glaucus, and then they transition and further to the north, they're fixed for canadensis. The transition between the two forms is quite steep, and that seems to be the case for nearly all of the divergent um, forms. And all the lines cluster around a center point that's marked with this dashed line. Okay, then you can look at the red lines. These are from individuals collected in the early 2010s. And they all have a similar shape too, and they all center around this solid line. And the gap between these center points suggests that the hybrid zone has shifted northward by about 40 kilometers between 1980 and 2012, which is basically a 30 year period. And now I'm not showing you the data to prove it, um, but what we concluded is that a lengthening of the growing season allowed the southerly species, which has facultative di uh, diapause in two generations per year, it basically allowed two generations to establish further to the north instead of just one generation. 
In fact, this 40 kilometer shift corresponds to um, a th thermal threshold required to complete two generations, how much that has actually moved climatologically. So you'll have to read the paper. I'm gonna leave it to you to read the paper to see the full rationale. But we conclude that because climate exerts strong selection in these species, which is why that climb is so steep, and the fact that the climate has changed, the hybrid zone as a whole has moved. And the amount of this shift corresponds to the amount of warming that we've observed over the last several decades. If we had not studied the specific traits at the population scale and their function, we would not have known if the hybrid zone would change, if it would break down, or if it would move intact. In fact, it seems to be moving intact, at least so far. Now I want to change gears. And I want to turn to that second meaning for adaptation, adaptation as management. So we're going to leave behind population variation for a little bit. Um, and we're going to focus on what it means to uh, make adjustments uh, for biodiversity under climate change. We're also going to move from butterflies to talking a lot more about people and how people choose to steward systems under climate change. Adaptation is something that people do and people make choices about what to do and how to do it. There is a growing need to manage biodiversity in the face of climate change, but there is very little research to guide us. And that means we have to build the science of adaptation and we have to implement it essentially at the same time. So I have another question for you. Go back to the chat window, get your fingers ready, wake up. What are some adaptation techniques, some ways that we might be able to mitigate climate risk for biodiversity, whatever kind of biodiversity you're interested in? What kinds of adaptation techniques have you heard about or that you're aware of? Will you please take a moment to type some strategies, adaptation strategies you know about into the chat box, please? Newt Nadelhofer, nice to see you. Moving, moving, moving. <laughs> sea walls, protection of um umbrella species, moving. I'll tell you, I'm gonna talk a little bit about moving and I'm gonna tell you why I think thinking about moving is actually useful uh, in considering adaptation in general. Anybody else wanna chime in? All right, I'll keep it going. If other folks have ideas they wanna to toss into the chat window, it'll still be there. Okay, so what's the main strategy we use now for reducing the ecological effects of climate change? Just straight up habitat conservation. We save places on earth with the aspiration that uh, the stuff in that location will, its resiliency will be enhanced with greater area. It will have greater potential to withstand, withstand change. If this method is to be effective, though, we need to know a lot about population biology. We have to know which populations are the most important or most valuable to protect within a species range. There is the um, 30 by 30 goal, but we will not be able to save all places on Earth. We have to prioritize, and we need to consider population variation 
uh, as a criteria in deciding where to put our habitat conservation priorities with respect to adaptation. We're also going to want to focus protection on populations with maximum genetic diversity. Another strategy, restoration. We will want to restore habitats to protect natural and human systems from climate change. And when we do, it will be quite important to put the right ecotypes in the right place in order for the restoration activity to be successful. And as many of you suggested, we could also help species move either by building pathways to make the landscape more permeable or by directly picking them up and carrying them where they need to go. In both cases, we're going to want to know the suitability of source populations for the regions we are moving them to. And somebody also suggested we could actually manipulate species to enhance their performance under climate change through breeding or other techniques, just like we breed desirable traits in crops like apples. And to do this, we're going to need to know about the genetic basis of climatic tolerance and draw on genetic diversity. So I want to look at one of these strategies more closely, mandatory relocation, or as it's sometimes called, assisted migration. We can talk in the Q&A if you want to about the terminology. I prefer managed relocation. Managed relocation is the intentional movement of species or traits from areas of historic occupancy to areas that become newly suitable under climate change. This is the picture from the Boston Globe that shows this fellow very eager to purposefully trans, um, move this uh, rodent over a dispersal barrier to the other side for the purposes of conservation. Managed relocation, like every form of management, has potential upsides and it has risks. And importantly, and I cannot overemphasize this, all adaptation actions will have side effects. I want to talk about side effects for managed relocation here in a moment. I think it's really interesting and ecologists have very, been very fascinated with the potential side effects of managed relocation, but all adaptation actions will have side effects because they are interventions. In fact, there are very few studies of managed relocation. Experiments are most certainly needed, um, but it is also possible to explore proxies of benefits and risk. So here's just one example, again, from quite a while ago now. Uh, a student and I used current invasive species to examine the risk of creating new pests with managed relocation. And we did that by building a database of invasive species in the US but, and identifying the continent of that each species origin. And we suggested that those species that come from within this continent, within North America, what we called intracontinental movement, you could think of this as being similar to or analogous to managed relocation. And we found that relatively few invasive species in our database had an intracontinental origin, about 14% on average, shown by these black bars in this graph shown across a scale of invasive severity. But if you break these data out by taxonomic group, you see that some groups have a quite high percentage of invasive species with an intracontinental origin. And this suggests that managed relocation, moving species around even regionally, could be quite risky in those cases. So you could have a low risk overall, but in particular contexts, a substantially higher risk. Ultimately, we need to build decision support tools for managed relocation and other adaptation strategies. In one of the first papers um, to put forward some ideas on decision making, a group of us suggested that four dimensions are important. And these four dimensions are shown on these figures in this slide. They are the impacts of climate change, which we call the focal impact, the risk of negative side effects, which we call collateral impact, the social acceptability of the action, 
and the feasibility of the intervention itself. In a 2009 PNAS paper, we explored three different cases and two different points of view on these four axes. And the details of that aren't really important, but our key point is that this framework could be the basis of thoughtful debate of how different people would conceive of managed relocation and where their concerns, their, their sense of need and their concerns about efficacy or justification arise. I still think this is one of the most useful frameworks out there. And I think it's also a really interesting example in adaptation of taking science, things like focal impact and collateral impact, which are assessed by empirical ecological studies and combining them with values like social acceptability and feasibility, which would have some economic components, for example. And that in this type of framework, you can allow science and values to come into contact with one another and combine them in a thoughtful way. More recently, a group of colleagues and I worked with the National Park Service to help them build a risk assessment tool for managed relocation. Here we suggest using, asking five questions also about things like justification, feasibility, acceptability, management priorities to evaluate how risky a managed relocation action might be. And we scored several species using this risk assessment tool. And this table shows the scoring for the Kerner blue butterfly. Back to that beautiful butterfly I showed a photo of earlier. So the colors in this table point to level of risk um, across a variety of risk of the risk in response to, with respect to several different dimensions. So generally you see in the greens and yellows that we found relatively low risk for the Carner blue butterfly. Interestingly, the highest risk that we identified was an indirect one, this orange color here in the middle, that fostering host plants of this butterfly could have a negative impact on other native plants. So this workbook is currently available on the NPS website and is forthcoming in a paper later this year. If this is a topic of interest to you, it's worth, uh, it's an interesting exercise to take a species of interest to you and go through the workbook and see how you would assess the risk across these different questions and um, risk criteria. But you know what? This table does not have much to say about local adaptation and population differentiation. And I made this point many times. This is partly because the Park Service is concerned principally with species conservation but it's also because we don't have good population data in many cases. I showed you the differential mapping with respect to the Carner Blue, but we really don't have uh, common garden experiments or genetic information to tell us that much about population variation in the Carner Blue with respect to climatic tolerance. So I think we should, can improve upon this and add even further dimensions by taking into consideration local adaptation information. There is so much research still to be done on management and the climate change. I've shown you one example study of invasion risk for managed relocation where we found low overall risk but evidence for higher risk in particular systems or groups or contexts, context dependence. I also showed some very applied work that imagines how we might make decisions about managed relocation. And here, my main point is what humans want and how humans feel about risk and reward is very important. It's not just ecology. And I like to think about this as sort of being related to the human imagination. Collectively, we are asking ourselves, 
what future do we want? What future are we feasibly able to create? What future can we even imagine? In general, but specifically with respect to biodiversity. Adapting biodiversity to climate change actually requires human imagination in addition to ecological science. And speaking of human imagination, I want to raise one more intervention that ecologists should be paying attention to. As part of an NSF workshop, some colleagues and I published a thought piece in PNAS earlier this year on geoengineering. Maybe you've heard about geoengineering. More specifically, we, our piece was on solar radiation modification using stratospheric aerosol intervention. This is a real thing. The idea is to pump high in the atmosphere, tiny little sulfur aerosols to reflect incoming solar radiation and thus avoid some portion of global warming. If the radiation does not come into the earth system, then it doesn't get trapped by greenhouse gases. This is a real thing that may be necessary to forestall catastrophic effects of climate change. Not that we're necessarily about ready to do it, but it is a tool in the toolbox, particularly as we move further and further down the business as usual trajectory. Our climate modeling colleagues are already exploring the feasibility of this uh, technique and the side effects sort of general with, generally with respect to the climate, with respect to food production. And the main point of our paper is that ecologists need to get involved in that work. For a long time, ecologists worked on impacts of climate change. We were somewhat reticent, but eventually got into studying adaptation strategies to climate change. This is yet another um, conversation that is going on in the scientific community with ecological consequences concerning climate change that we also need to participate in. So this figure from our paper shows many paths and unknowns of how injecting stratospheric aerosols in the atmosphere could affect ecosystems. It could affect species distributions, of course. It could also affect regional and global biogeochemistry, could affect animal migrations could affect the productivity of fisheries and many, many other things. On the other hand, the implementation of uh, this stratospheric aerosol intervention or geoengineering more generally could actually be guided by some biodiversity goals. And it could help alleviate some of the effects of climate change and therefore reduce the need of, for some adaptation actions like, for example, industry education. So is this, is geoengineering good or bad? That is not a yes, no kind of question. We need science to help, help us answer what is ultimately a human intervention question. I think there's so much fascinating ecological work to do in this um, applied context. So I want to leave you with an open question. You can type this, type your thoughts in the chat if you'd like to. Um, have I convinced you in any way? Firstly, I wanted to show that there's an important role for studying population differences. And then I turn to the significance of human intervention strategies. Do you see the importance and would you consider con examining population differentiation and incorporating strategies for climate change adaptation or intervention strategies into your own work? I think the significance of population variation still is underrepresented in our work on climate change and climate change projections. And I think work on adaptation strategies and human interventions for biodiversity is woefully um, underexplored relative to its need and the problems that confront us today. So if something inspired you in my talk today, or you'd like to know more, 
you can use this reference list to chase down the relevant papers. And each of my slides I threw on a reference. So here's the thing, now that we live in Zoom land and this is recorded, you can come back to this video and pause straight on the slide and trace down the very specific paper. You can also, of course, email me and say, hey, I'd like to know more about this thing that you showed and I can point you to the original source. Many, many people contributed to the retrospective I shared with you today, including a bunch of grad students and postdocs and undergrads and collaborators, and I'm so grateful for their important work. And I want to thank you all for signing in and listening to my presentation and imagining with me about how ecologists can play a role in thinking about what the future of biodiversity looks like. Thanks very much. Okay, I am now entering cyberspace. This is uh, Jenny. I'm the communications coordinator for the station and I'm opening the Q&A now. If anyone would like to ask Jessica a question, and in the meantime, let me just thank Dr. Hellman from all of us at the biological station for a particularly engaging talk. I learned a lot and my human imagination was certainly inspired. <laughs> so thank you, Dr. Hellman. And everyone is welcome to answer or ask questions in the Q&A. And it looks like, let's see here. Amy has a comment in the chat. She does. Which we can, let's call that out. Yeah, she says population is ecology is important, but what about all the species interacting that regulate the, and all the processes that regulate those populations? Yeah, that too. I think it's interesting. I guess one of my key points, and I agree with that, is that I consider myself a population and community ecologist. And of course, I know ecosystems are important too, but I do think that it is the variation that is captured that exists out there in nature that we tend to oversimplify when we're imagining what will happen to biodiversity under climate change. And so for me, focusing on the population level and the genet that genetically based variation is in one way to formalize that spatial variation and the differences in which organisms respond to climate change. But thinking about how species interactions vary in different places in different locations, also very important. All right, looks like, oh, someone's asking about where to find the recording. I can answer that. It'll be on the UMBS <laughs> website and on our YouTube channel. And now we've got another question from Steve Bertman, our co-director of the Research Experience from Undergrads program. And I'm guessing the REUs also want to know the answer to this question. So Jessica, how would you respond to someone arguing that humans shouldn't play God? Steve, I love this question um, because it, it, we, I could talk about this for a long time. I hope maybe you and the REU students will actually, maybe you could spend some time thinking about this or discussing it even amongst yourselves. So what I think is interesting about that is um, we could start by thinking, what is the opposite of that? Are we not playing God? What does it mean to play God? Uh, I think ecologists often assume that the, that the natural world is a thing that is independent of humans. And I don't mean to oversimplify that, but we tend to think of nature as something out there that is happening by itself and God is controlling it. And who are we to presume that we could interfere with that natural process? Except we do interfere with that natural process. And the principal way that we interfere with it is by causing climate change. So I think when we think about stewardship, including stopping the emission of greenhouse gases, it's helpful not to say that it is, you know, we should do this because we are God, but to acknowledge that our influence on the natural world is profound and we have stewardship responsibilities and responsibilities to sustain our own well-being that obligates us to think thoughtfully about how our actions inter interact with the natural world. 
So that makes, for me, it makes me open to thinking about adaptation because I don't see a fundamental wrong about it. I think it might not work. I think it could be harmful. I think all of these different evaluative criteria, but I don't think personally that we are crossing some boundary that separates humanity and nature because I think we are part of nature and we are profoundly impacting it all the time. And our duty is to do it intelligently. Other people see that differently and have different philosophical frames that they bring to that discussion, which is why I think it's such a rich question. Great answer. So we've got another question from our general ecology instructor, Brian Schultens. Brian would like to know, should we be thinking about reconstructing entire ecosystems in new locations rather than just individual species or small numbers of species? So Brian, first of all, uh, I'm hoping and assuming that there are people in your class who are discovering the point of statistics for the first time. So congratulations on that. It's life changing, right? Um, at least that was the case for me. Uh, yes, I do think, so there's a related concept about the, the idea of novel ecosystems, whether they are crafted by humans or climate change itself just plays out. There will be compositions of species that occur in the future under climate change that are different than the composition that occurred now. That's certainly the case in the historic past. There were communities that we uh, say during the peak of the last ice age that we wouldn't even recognize today because of the sorting due to climate. But when we think about intervening, might we consider entire ecological assemblages? I think that's essentially what we would be doing in a restoration project if we're paying attention to the efficacy and the sort of durability of a restoration activity. We might think about incorporating different species or different compositions of species in that location. The other thing I think is it, it is a bit sloppy to imagine moving individual species. So for example, one of the uh, butterflies I talked at the beginning uh, with its northern range boundary in, uh, on Vancouver Island, it feeds on oak trees. So if you even wanted to consider the possibility of moving that species northward, there are no oaks further to the north. So you'd have to move the oaks for the butterfly. Um, and then, then you start thinking, oh, well, actually that oak species does particularly well when it's inoculated with mycorrhizae. There were some studies from Southern Oregon University that showed um, performance. So maybe when you plant the oak trees, you should inoculate it with the mycorrhizae and you can quickly end up with these multiple species interactions, uh, which I think is really um, intellectually rigorous and an important thing to do. And also in that Carner Blue case where I said we did some risk assessment, that the indirect effects that this was a case of imagining, well, you guys would appreciate this, a case of imagining introducing the Carner Blue butterfly at the Sleeping Bear Dunes National Lakeshore. Because it's a similar habitat, it's further to the north than some populations that have been locally extirpated where you would probably need to foster, you would need to foster the lupins, the host plant uh, at the sleeping bear dunes and lupins are nitrogen fixing and they might modify the local environment. And there are some endangered plants of importance at the sleeping bear dunes. So it might not be the Carner blue that you're worried about, but it's things that you would need to do to prepare the site for it. So these are really, really, really important questions and go back to Amy's point about species interactions. Yeah, and on that note, another question asks, what do you think about introducing new slash invasive species into ecosystems that are expected to lose its composition due to climate change? So we, um, several years ago, um, it's interesting when you think about the different motivations for managed relocation, we tend to think of, I have a species that I like and I'm worried about. And so I'm looking for a place to put it. Um, I worked several years ago. In fact, one of the papers that I referenced, uh, the lead author is Maria Halfors at the University of Helsinki. I started working with these Finns who were interested in managed relocation. They had a bunch of Finnish plants that they were wanting to move. And I thought, oh, that's so funny. 
I mean, you're in Finland. It's, it's great that you want to move Finnish plants, but aren't you more likely to be like the recipient region? Or rather, you're going to be receiving Southern Europe's plants being up there, sort of the top of the world. Um, so uh, another motivation that you, we, we call that kind of um, push. Late in another paper, we called this idea that I have a species I'm looking for a home for. This is kind of push assisted migration and managed relocation. But you could also imagine another form that we call pull, which is I have a function that is lost. I'm looking for a species that could do something for me rather than having a species that I want to find a home for. Uh, and I think that's what you're suggesting. Um, and if you're interested, I could send you this, that paper, but, or you could Google push versus pull, um, managed relocation or assisted migration. So another question here from James, I am an engineer rather than a biologist, and I'm interested in what kind of technology aids you in these restoration and conservation efforts. Do any recent advancements come to mind that make your job easier? Oh, wow, that's a terrific question. I can't think immediately offhand. Well, there are a number of tools that are, I mean, genomic tools are incredibly important for many of the things I talked about. Um, climate monitoring, um tools that enable us to get much finer resolution understanding of climate and microclimates that is a very important engineering thing that benefits this work another thing though your question strikes me to think about when we often talk about the benefits the potential benefits and the risks of any adaptation action one risk is always that you're just wasting your time and money. And one way that you could be wasting your time and money on managed relocation is that you just have to go through this massive effort of cultivating a species. In many cases, especially for endangered species, you probably would need to go to this massive effort of cultivating the species so that you could introduce it. And I bet you there's a bunch of really interesting sort of engineering work that could be done about what would be the sort of apparatus for breeding and cultivation before or to facilitate um, both species reintroduction, but also moving into new locations. That's an interesting question. Kind of a not great answer. <laughs> Well, I think unless any other questions are coming through, we'll we'll wrap it up for now. So Jessica, I just want to thank you again so very much for your time and for your generosity and sticking around and answering these questions. Um, and I, I hope that people will view this recording later and um, possibly formulate some new questions. So we thank you so much and really appreciate your wonderful talk tonight. And my final pitch is for everyone here to please tune in to our next lecture. On August 10th, Dr. Newt Nadelhofer will be giving our Bennett lecture in plant and fungal ecology. You can't miss a talk by Newt Nadelhofer. <laughs> He's a legend. <laughs> Jenny, thank you so much. It's been fun. Thanks, Jessica. And take care, everybody.